Okay, yeah, I'd like to speak about um, yeah, some high performance and scaling techniques that we've been doing in um, Golang. Um, small breakdown of the presentation, a few slides about myself and some work that we do with Minio. Um, am, do you understand me or not? Okay. Better? Or? Nee, je kraag zit ervoor. Oké. Okay. Waar kan die beter zitten dan? Is it, is it better like this? Yeah. Oké, okay. great. Um, so, um, a little intro about myself and Minio. Um, then I'd like to speak sort of in general a little bit about um, yeah, the Golang or Plan 9 assembly capabilities that Go offers. Then uh, discuss two sort of projects that we've done uh, with this, so Blake 2B acceleration and SHA-256 acceleration. And finally some slides about some yeah, distributed syncing stuff um, that we've uh, been doing. One slide about myself. Um, I've been mostly doing software development in sort of what's called the medical imaging space, so that relates to like CT and MR uh, images from scanners, uh, both 2D, 3D, uh, as well as using GPU techniques. And uh, the last few years, I've been involved in cloud computing, and uh, I'm now with, uh, with Minio. Uh, Minio, as maybe some of you know, is uh, an Amazon S3 compatible uh, yeah, object storage server. Uh, it is uh, yeah, written in Golang under the Apache 2.0 license. The company was actually founded by Anand Babu Perisiami, who maybe some of you know as one of the guys behind uh, uh, the Gluster FS uh, system, which uh, is in itself a uh, distributed uh, file system, which is now part of uh, Red Hat, actually. Um, if you look at Minio itself, there's actually sort of really, yeah, one, one project, one binary, uh, but you can run it in sort of three different flavors. So um, the simplest uh, version is simply uh, run Minio server with a single uh, directory, and then, uh, you know, all your objects will be stored underneath um, this directory structure. And um, there are also, uh, yeah, two other versions that uh, use a technique that is called uh, erasure coding. So what this essentially does is all the objects are split up into both uh, like data chunks and parity chunks and um, yeah, split over um, yeah, multiple disks or multiple servers. And um, the Minio server actually, um, the Excel backend, which uh, splits the data over multiple disks, um, um, goes from a minimum of four disks up to a maximum of 16 uh, disks. And uh, it, it also uses a technique that is called bit rot protection. So this means that when um, the data is being read off the disk again, which can be many years later than when it is stored, um, a hash is computed to detect any yeah, bit rot changes. And if that happens, then um, yeah, we have other parity blocks to uh, recon yeah, reconstruct the uh, original data, um, but as you can imagine, this bit rot protection is a very frequent operation, so any data that's written to disk, um, hashes have to be computed, and likewise, um, when data is being read off the disk, um, yeah, the hash needs to be computed as well, um, before we actually can return uh, yeah, any, any information uh, to uh, the clients. So that's a pretty important Um, operation for us and that's why we really looked at how can we get sort of the maximum performance in terms of uh, hashing speeds while still you know having a solid um, proof and hashing technique. So um, that's actually how we um, yeah did our Lake 2B uh, project. Um, but before I go into that let me explain to you a little bit about um, yeah sort of the, uh, the the Golang or Plan 9 assembly. Uh, capabilities. This is actually a yeah an integrated or integral part of the whole Go uh, tool chain, um, and uh, it's actually yeah, it's kind of like a pseudo assembly language language in the sense that it's not a the direct assembly that you would write for say an Intel platform or uh, an ARM. 
platform. So uh, there are some like generalized instructions for like a move and an add and a compare. Um, and these instructions are then <coughs> obviously translated to the actual instructions that will run on the underlying uh, hardware uh, platform. Most of the time, it's kind of logical how like this pseudo assembly language translates into the underlying uh, assembly running on the, uh, the CPU itself. Sometimes, yeah, that is not the case. Uh, so um, it's a little, sometimes a little bit of trial and error there. Uh, and also some architectural aspects of the underlying uh, architecture, they shine through. So on the ARM, you have like conditional instructions and you can do that too. And obviously on an Intel, that will, uh, that will not work. Um, also, for instance, data uh, flows from left to right. So if you do like a move, uh, you have a move R1 to R2. It's actually R2 becomes R1. Um, and yeah, uh, like on the ARM platform, it's the other way around. So there's some things you have to be aware of. Um, there's also some, yeah, like pseudo registers. So they're not actual registers, but kind of like simulated registers uh, for like frame pointer, stack pointer, program counter. Um, and, and also, um, not all instructions that you would want to write are uh, available. However, it is possible to also, um, yeah, not use sort of the mnemonics, but use the actual opcodes that will go into uh, the assembly. So if it's not available, you can resort, um, yeah, to that. Um, if you talk about, yeah, what are sort of the advantages that you get with, um, like, assembly language, and obviously, um, yeah, it sort of gives you the ability to get the maximum performance out of the, uh, the underlying uh, hardware. Um, and also, if you do this, then, um, yeah, you still benefit from, you know, the nice, quick, and fast compilation that Go uh, offers. Um, you know, to get, like, uh, assembly uh, into your code, you can also uh, use, for instance, the, the, the CGO uh, route, but um, yeah, that has some disadvantages. Um, one is that yeah, you need to have the CGO um, yeah uh, available. Uh, it takes longer to compile because again, it's more like a C style uh, compile that uh, that happens. And also, when you call into that code, then um, yeah, there is some runtime overhead because all the stack needs to be saved and everything. And um, if you write your own assembly, um, yeah, you don't have that uh, that overhead. And obviously, if you um, use uh, assembly, you can take advantage of uh, the uh, yeah, SMID instructions for Intel or the NEON instructions that are available on, uh, on ARM. Um, as maybe a little bit kind of a word of caution is that you, yeah, you are a bit on your own if you do this kind of stuff. The documentation is kind of limited and a little bit sparse. Um, there is a considerable amount of kind of example code in, 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 in the Go repository itself as well for stuff like mutexes and some lower level stuff. So actually, if you grab for star.s in the Go code, you will see um, yeah, a lot of examples there. And um, yeah, likewise, we now have a few repositories where there's also some, uh, some Go code in there. Uh, and as an example, basically, this is actually yeah, also a file where you can sort of see the translation between this pseudo assembly language and the actual ARM instructions as they are being, uh, being generated. Um, if you want to um, integrate um, uh, yeah, assembly into Golang, then um, you have to yeah, use the .s um, extension for um, yeah, basically assembly. And um, that is actually prepended uh, by sort of an architecture um, yeah, uh, identifier. So underscore ARM64 um, means that the assembly is for the ARM 64-bit uh, platform and likewise AMD 64 um, will be for you know, the Intel uh, or AMD 64 bit uh, platform. And actually here is a snapshot of a repository. It's a little bit hard to read, but uh, here actually you can see um, actually several versions for um, the AMD 64 platform because in this repository we actually have a dedicated AVX2, AVX and an SSE version, and then there is an ARM version. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of uh, AVX2 and AVX um, later on uh, in the presentation. Um, so kind of one approach um, that has worked nicely for us is if you do this kind of stuff, 
uh, is um, to actually start out with um, you know an algorithm at the, the Go level uh, itself. Um, because well, even if you do this, then you are not likely to do all the work for all the different uh, architects that are out there. So it always makes sense to have as a baseline sort of um, the functionality in, in Go itself. And um, then sort of as you start to, yeah, translate that functionality into uh, assembly, what we sort of did is we started out kind of like uh, with small bits and pieces. Um, and so you comment out most of the Go code in your routine or class or whatever. And um, then you start to translate small bits and pieces into uh, assembly, maybe initially starting just with passing in the arguments and writing back some results, making sure that all works. And um, once you got it working, then uh, you, know, you gradually start to translate more and more of your Go functionality into uh, assembly and along the, uh, along the way, yeah, make um, tests whether uh, the assembly functionality is equivalent to, um, to the Go uh, assembly. So actually, if you look, for instance, at the commit history of the Blake 2B SMID uh, repository, you, connect, you can actually see how, yeah, how we used um, this technique. Um, along the way, we also developed a small uh, utility called SM2 Plan 9S, which actually uh, generates byte sequence codes for opcode or yeah, assembly instructions that are not natively supported um, yeah, by, uh, by Go itself. So actually, it uses uh, the, the ASM um, assembler uh, sort of behind the scenes. So what you do is you basically write your instruction um, as you would write it uh, regularly in assembler uh, or in, in assembly and then you run the tool on the file and then it will prepend um, that instruction with um, yeah the actual um, yeah opcodes that will go into the um, yeah the byte stream that will be executed so um, that has um, yeah worked nicely for us um, if you look at yeah, what we have done with um, yeah with assembly, um, we've actually uh, accelerated uh, the Blake 2B uh, algorithm as well as the SHA-256 algorithm, and uh, we're planning to do one more um, a piece of work, which um, uh, has to do with this erasure coding, which is actually called yeah, Reed Solomon, and um, this uses some yeah what they call Galois field arithmetic. Uh, polynomial multiplications and ARM actually has a um, specific PML instruction so um, we want to use that instruction to uh, accelerate the uh, the Reed Solomon um, computation of the, the parity blocks uh, for ARM uh, for Intel it is already um, yeah accelerated um, but we want to do the same for uh, for the ARM platform and um, yeah, maybe when there is a need um, in certain pieces of the code, then um, yeah, we will likely do, uh, do more. Okay, so the first technique that we accelerated uh, is a hashing technique that is called uh, Blake 2B. Um, yeah, Blake 2B is a hashing um, technique. It was actually, uh, there was like a SHA-3 uh, competition um, a few years ago, and they were one of the five, I think, final contenders. Um, in the end, they, they, they were not selected, but um, it is yeah um, a nice um, hashing technique uh, with sort of the characteristics that it's um, yeah it's really focused on on speed um, as well as kind of like a relatively simple algorithm to implement um, while at the same time still offering sort of um, top of the yeah, top of the bill uh, security and it's really optimized for 64-bit yeah, uh, platforms. So we developed a uh, repository uh, using the SMID instructions to uh, accelerate the, um, yeah, the Blake 2B uh, algorithm. And actually, we um, did it in sort of three flavors. So there's an AVX2 um, yeah, implementation, which is the, the fastest. Then there's an AVX, and then there's an SSE implementation. So depending on what your CPU support, um, then obviously the highest level of SMID instructions that are that is supported, that one will be used, uh, but overall we were able to achieve close to like a 4x uh, performance improvement over um, yeah, the, um, the Go, uh, the high level Go functionality. So um, yeah, um, that helped us quite a bit because 
If you look at the table on the right, uh, you can, well, it's a little bit too small, but we can do about 850 megabytes per second um, with the Blake 2B algorithm on an AVX2 uh, machine. And this compares to, um, if you look at chart 256, that is at like 190 megabytes per second. And um, SHA 512 is at about 300 uh, megabytes per second. And uh, as an object storage, you can imagine if you have large blobs um, of data written on the disk, then uh, and again, for us to be able to return like the first byte when people ask for, for an object, say if it's a one gigabyte object, then having a factor of four uh, there, that means the difference between being able to return um, something within a second or within it taking four seconds. So that's, that's a pretty um, significant saving there. Um, and again, yeah, so we uh, uh, developed this technique for the, the bit rot um, yeah, detection mechanism that is part of, uh, of Minio. If you look a little bit closer at sort of how it works, um, uh, the top line, those are actually, there's a very small portion of all the kind of computations that are happening uh, as part of the Blake 2B uh, hashing. So uh, there's basically four um, yeah, uh, additions uh, there, and these are on 64-bit uh, uh, bit integers. Um, and um, uh, if you look at the AVX um, yeah, capabilities for the Intel platform, you can essentially work with 128-bit uh, wide registers. So this allows you to do liter literally like two additions uh, in parallel. And this is kind of what you see here. So uh, with AVX2, you use uh, what are called the, the, the XMM registers. So again, those are 128 bits wide registers. So essentially, this means that whereas here, it's kind of like two lines. Uh, you can do it here basically yeah, in a single line. And likewise, uh, the second um, XMM instruction uh, will also take care of two of these uh, guys. So um, you can sort of go from like four to uh, instructions to like two instructions. And um, if you go one step further, AVX2 um, extended the pipeline to uh, yeah, 256 bits wide, which means that um, uh, yeah, you can use or do essentially four 64-bit additions with a single instruction. So that's actually this guy. And then here you use the YMM registers instead of the XMM registers. And uh, again, uh, those are 256-bit instructions wide. So in a way, this kind of explains why there's kind of a four times speed up between, um, yeah, like Golang and AVX2. Uh, there's, there's a bit more there, but I mean, fundamentally, um, this explains it um, quite a bit. Um, if you look at Blake 2B, uh, the algorithm itself, it actually has sort of 12 rounds of yeah, uh, working on the data. Um, this is kind of like the preamble where uh, first um, uh, the message uh, is being read in, then it's kind of shuffled around, and then there are two uh, sort of macros that actually do the um, actual like XORing and adding and, and, and rotations of um, yeah, all, 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 all the bits. Then um, there's like a diagonalized macro there, which kind of rotates um, val uh, yeah, values between uh, the different um, yeah, uh, values that you are working on. And then there is a second half where you load more from the message, you shuffle it again, and you call the same macros uh, again. And finally, you undiagonalize, so you sort of shift it back. And um, if you look at um, yeah one of the macros, so in this case this is the uh, well, what's called the G1 macro. It actually consists a little bit of like three columns. So on the right side of the screen, you kind of see the the high level Golang uh, instruction. Then in the the middle part of the screen, you sort of see the um, the AVX uh, instruction, and then on the left side of the screen is the actual um, yeah. Um, opcodes that are being written in, 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 into the assembly uh, stream. And um, so actually what this guy does is here, there's like, um, yeah, this, is, this is an addition, this is uh, like an XOR. Uh, here you actually see a rotation, but the Blake 2 algorithm um, has uh, selected um, like shift uh, values that nicely map onto um, yeah, the Intel architecture, so you can actually 
while it's a shift over there, it's actually um, a shuffle. So you shuffle bytes around uh, in between the registers. So and then there's more additions, more uh, XORing, and then yeah, yet another kind of rotation. And this happens, you know, over and over again, and then in a total of 12 rounds. And that's you know how you um, get your um, your hash out there. Okay, that was um, about the the Blake 2B um, algorithm. We've also done some work on um, yeah, the SHA-256 algorithm, um, most notably also uh, for the ARM uh, platform, because the ARM platform actually has uh, specific instructions to um, accelerate SHA-256 um, yeah, um, calculations, and uh, they make a tremendous amount of difference because it liter literally uh, is 100 times faster than uh, not using those instructions. And uh, actually, Intel also has instructions uh, for SHA-256 uh, accelerations, but um, they seem to be just defined in software, and there seem to be no hardware implementations out there. Otherwise, it would be nice to take advantage of, uh, of that as well. Um, but actually, the table here at the bottom, you can sort of see um, yeah, the speeds that we, uh, that we have. And interestingly speaking, actually, uh, the ARM just running at 1.2 gigahertz is actually the quickest one out there, so it does about 640 megabytes per second. And then um, uh, we ran some tests on, a, on an Intel Xeon at 2.4 gigahertz. Um, the AVX2 comes in at about 355. Um, then the AVX is running uh, around 300. Uh, SSE still a little bit lower than that. And uh, these are actually the, the Go versions. So if you do Go um, on the Intel um, Xeon platform, you get about 190. And um, the last one is the, uh, the, uh, the ARM version. Um, if you look at you know, how um, do you actually invoke uh, yeah, assembly code uh, from Go, um, you do. You essentially define kind of a uh, yeah the prototype of the function that you're going to call into. So um, for most of these um, hashing techniques, you, know, you pass in like the digest that you start with and um, the message itself. So the digest is basically just a slice of um, of, of uh, 30 qubit integers, and the message is just um, yeah, a slice of bytes. Um, and uh, here we actually. Um, yeah, compute um, the eight um, yeah, uh, 32 bit integers into the digest. So that's this guy. And then basically um, uh, the um, actual message that you're going to hash is being passed in directly into what will be the, um, the assembly code. And then once you're done, um, <coughs> then actually the result is written in this guy. So that is what you, uh, what you return. Um, and um, uh, this is actually um, an ARM example. Uh, so the first line, that's basically how you yeah, define uh, the function uh, in uh, the assembly code. And uh, the first thing that you actually do is to yeah, read the parameters that were being passed in. And um, uh, this function uh, takes two slices as, uh, as inputs. And as maybe some of you know, a slice is actually a structure with like three elements uh, in it. And uh, the first element is a pointer to where the actual data is. And the second is actually the length of um, yeah, the, uh, the slice. Um, so what we're doing is uh, the first few instructions were uh, reading this here. And uh, because this is running on a uh, 64-bit yeah, um, platform, uh, both slices in effect, um, they take up a total of 24 bytes. So uh, again, it's three elements, but each element is eight bytes long. So the first instruction basically um, fetches um, a pointer to where the digest is. And uh, the second line fetches a pointer to where um, the message is. And then um, the length of the message is being read at uh, um, in the third statement. So um, uh, it's another eight bytes further than um, yeah, the already 20, 24 bytes, uh, which point into um, the second slice that is being passed in. Um, and then further down here, um, we do some initialization. So here we load uh, from X0, which corresponds to R0, 
um, uh, the digest. Um, we also load, um, obviously, from the message itself. Um, and uh, there's also a constants table. Uh, so we get a, basically a reference to the uh, constants table that's actually in R3. And R3 corresponds in neon to X3. So here we load um, values from the, um, from the constants table. And um, this is actually sort of the main uh, loop where uh, the hashing is being done. And um, again, here, uh, uh, R1, which is X1, um, is the pointer to um, yeah, the message. So here, actually, the values from the message are being read. And well, there's some, some like uh, positioning codes to make sure things are in kind of the right order. And then uh, these and these guys are actually the specialized ARM instructions that give you know basically the hundred times uh, speed up. Um, and then there's some more you know shuffling of data around. But um, yeah, all I have because these are specialized instructions. The actual assembly is yeah pretty uh, uh, pretty uh, pretty short. And then um, yeah, this is like um, the end of the. Um, Routine. So um, again, there's some yeah ARM instructions or uh, SHA um, extensions instructions here, um, and then here it's basically put into yeah V1 and V uh, V0 and V1, and uh, here actually you write out um, the result in like register 41 and uh, V1 into X0, which was the, the pointer to the, uh, the digest, and then you return uh, out of there. And obviously here, well, as long R2 is the length of the message, so you, you process 64 bytes at a time. And just when, uh, when there's more work to do, obviously, you loop back. And, um, so that's pretty much you know, how um, yeah, a function like this um, looks a little bit. Um, if you look at some, yeah, uh, some resources uh, that we have uh, or that are out there, actually, um, as maybe some of you know, uh, some of the origins of the Go, um, yeah, like architecture and, and work go back to uh, the, the whole Plan Nine. Um, yeah, worked on that has been done, and actually, yeah, some of the um, assembly. Um, yeah, still originates back to that. So some of the uh, documentation out there, um, yeah, is literally at the gp.io website. Um, so not everything in those um, URLs is kind of applicable. Most of it is, um, but it's they're generally generally good resources to read through and get an understanding of uh, how this all works and uh, ties in together. And then there's also like a high level uh, SM. Uh, Document and um, there's also uh, some pointers for ARM, some pointers for Intel about you know how Neon instructions and um, you know um, AVX instructions uh, work. Um, okay, that was sort of the um, like the performance optimizations that we've done for um, yeah uh, hashing. Uh, Techniques. Um, we also um, did some work on you know, something that we called a uh, distributed syncing technique. Uh, when I earlier talked about the three flavors of Minio uh, that are there, the uh, the last one that was um, listed is called the distributed version, and, um, and so we have two versions that can work with uh, erasure coding, and uh, then um, distributing the data across yeah, multiple either disks for the Excel version or uh, actually multiple servers uh, for the distributed version. And um, for the distributed version, that can actually run from anywhere uh, of a minimum of four servers up until a maximum of 16 servers. We needed to have a yeah, synchronization um, mechanism between the servers. And um, yeah, we also looked at some existing protocols and techniques out there. Um, but yeah, we like in a, a t technique like Raft. Um, but we found that a little bit overkill for sort of what we were trying to do. So we designed basically um, a pretty kind of minimalistic um, synchronization technique um, <coughs> that um, yeah works well for us. Um, the design goals uh, that we wanted to have was um, uh, basically 
keep the design simple. Um, also meaning uh, there's, for instance, no concept of like a master node. Um, because, well, if you have something with a master node and the master nodes go down, goes down, then, yeah, you, your whole system is down, so you need to have backup master nodes, and then you, you already talk about two or three master nodes, and uh, it quickly starts to become, you know, more complicated than, uh, than what you initially think. So uh, in our system, there's no concept of a master node, so all the nodes are basically, um, yeah, equal. Uh, it's also resilient in the sense that um, uh, if multiple servers go down, um, yeah, the system just continues to function. So basically, um, up to a total of um, yeah, n over 2 minus 1 servers uh, can be down. Um, so uh, yeah, you can continue to, uh, to function. Um, and um, yeah, we also wanted it to be kind of like a drop-in replacement for um, the existing primitives that are there in the, the Go language. So the API or, uh, or the interface is synonymous to uh, the sync.rw mutex and actually the sync.locker interface. Um, as part of our requirements, um, um, how we maximized um, sort of the maximum number of nodes to a total of... Um, uh, 15, uh, 16. Um, you could actually, if you wanted to, push that number up a little bit, but 16 is, uh, yeah, um, uh, good enough uh, for us. And um, um, how this works behind the scene is that all servers basically have a connection to all of the other servers, and when one of the nodes asks for a lock, it basically contacts all the other nodes. And when a majority of the nodes, um, um, yeah, return back um, the lock, then um, yeah, the lock is granted on that particular uh, machine. And, and when you release it, again, it sends out release messages. And um, um, so it's relatively simple, but um, yeah, for us, it um, it uh, it works quite well. Here is an example, maybe a little bit difficult to read, but um, again, uh, the API is um, um, compatible with the regular RW mutex. So basically, this is an example where you just um, create a, a mutex, and um, well, then you lock it uh, twice, and then there's some go routines that after one and two seconds unlock the, um, the read lock. And then here you try to acquire a write lock, and obviously the write lock can only be granted when both of the read locks that were earlier granted um, were uh, released. So you can sort of see here that so it's acquiring read lock one, read lock two, and then it's trying to acquire the the write lock, but it will block here until uh, both first the first read lock and the second read lock are uh, released, and only then will it require uh, the write lock. And obviously, running this on a single machine is not really the point, but um, you can just as well create basically uh, three um, of these named mutex on three machines and then run one read lock on one machine, another read lock on another machine, and the write on the third machine. And then uh, the whole sequence of events would be, uh, would be uh, identical. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, like performance uh, on a 16-node uh, configuration, we were able to do uh, like seven and a half thousand locks uh, per second, um, and then um, it takes about sort of 10 10 percent CPU usage on like a you know a regular uh, server, um, and typically a lock is granted within uh, like one millisecond. Uh, so this quite nicely met basically our requirement in terms of you know an object storage. Um, uh, an object storage does not have the requirement that you know you're, you you're going to write like a hundred thousand objects um, to it in like a second. So maybe for something like a key value store, this wouldn't work. But in our case, um, it, it quite nicely met uh, our requirements, and um, so it's nicely bundled with um, with the menu uh, distribution and. Um, Actually, here's a pointer to the um, the repository, and we also on our blog we have a blog post about this uh, with uh, some more details. So that pretty much brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. And, um Go ahead.
So um, I have a question. Um, so you are using Blake uh, to detect big dro big drought? Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you have performance problems, but uh, Blake is a secure hash. So mm -hmm. why don't you use a narrower detecting code, which is probably much, much cheaper instead of using a secure hash and then, you know. Mm, what do you mean by an error detecting code? Uh, well, actually something like uh, Reed Solomon or probably Hamming or, I don't know, something which is well, cheaper. Reed Solomon doesn't give you bit rot. I mean, Reed Solomon. Well, it, it detects you bit flips. So mm, no, not by itself. Well, maybe maybe Reed Solomon. I, well, I, I can't remember. I have to look it up. But Hamming codes, for example, detect errors, and there are much better suited uh, codes for detecting flip uh, well, bit flips. No, the problem is um, there's there's um, yeah parity blocks computed um, in Reed Solomon. But imagine uh, you have four, um, two data uh, blocks and two parity blocks, and when you lose, say, two disks, so you're down to two uh, blocks, then uh, if you would just have two blocks, you have no way to uh, determine anymore whether there's bit rot or not. So you're right, if you still have all the, uh, the data and parity blocks available, you could work out whether a block that you read off the disk has not been unchanged, but it would be not easy to do so. And when you lose those disks, or you're down to the, the absolute minimum that you need in order to be able to reconstruct, then the, yeah, then uh, you have no way to detect bit rot anymore. We, we, right? we talk about this later. I, I don't agree yet, but <laughs> let's. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this code doesn't rely on CGO. Is there any complication at all uh, compiling these kind of programs? Uh, 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 no, uh, it does, no, it does not uh, rely on CGO, but what, what is your question? Well, is there any, any complication uh, compiling this program, or is it just a go build and that's all? That's it. If you do a go get, you'll get all the um, repositories and it just builds normally. And there's, uh, yeah, you just need to have the go chain Okay. Installed, but no special other options or uh, features of the Go toolchain. Okay, it will just adapt to the to the platform, to the CPU, yeah. and this kind of thing. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Oh, there's Thank a you. Question there. Oh. Okay. Oh, coming. Um, I was just wondering, how did you write um, the assembly? I mean, uh, you showed us all these opcodes. Mm -hmm. Did you use some other assembler and then uh, extract this, yeah. or how did you? That for that, we developed basically this tool. So we developed this SM2 Plan 9S tool, which is also, uh, here you see the repository. So basically, this is what you write in your uh, assembly file, and then you run SM2 plan 9s uh -huh. on this file, and it will prepend um, like the byte sequence. Oh, in okay, front sorry, of it, right? I, so, I missed that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, otherwise it's a bit cumbersome. Um, <laughs> pretty cumbersome. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh. Could you pass that mic? Yes, my question was regarding to your uh, SHA-256 implementation. Um, have you thought about contributing it into the Thunderbird uh, library? Yeah, we, we were planning to do that, but we need to do a bit more work for that, but uh, that's, that will be coming, yeah. Because uh, uh, Second question, mm -hmm. uh, how come your implementation is faster than the Go Thunderbird library for uh, AMD64 since uh, both are in assembly and have an AVX2 implementation? So what, did you do um, something special? Um, well, I mean, there's different ways to do different things in assembly, right? So, um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's not gonna be a factor 2x, but I mean, depending on how you exactly do it, you may see like still minor, um, yeah, differences. So, um, just like in regular high level Go, you can also, one maybe way of doing things may be slightly better than another way of doing it, so. Thank you. Okay, thank you.